Well, first of all, I, I would like to thank the committee and the organizers for this uh, really unique workshop. I mean, it's a great honor for me to speak in front of such a distinguished audience. Uh, the concept notes that introduces the workshop concludes very nicely by saying, I quote, that we need to remember the past, explore the present, and imagine the future. And I would like to begin my talk, actually, by remembering the past. Uh, this year, as you know, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of uh, the work of Louis de Broil, in which he hypothesized that the wave should be attributed to every particle of matter. So let me step back at the end of the 19th century, a time at which uh, everything was very clear and simple. Uh, we had light was a wave, which could be defined by its frequency and, and wave vector if you take a plane wave. And particles, matter was composed of particles defined by their energy and momentum. Then Einstein came, 1905, and to explain black body radiation, he says that we should multiply everything by h bar for light, and then we get the, the light quanta that were called photons later on. And de Broil, 100 years ago, just made the reverse part for particles. He took the, the right column and divided by h bar, and then he assigned a wavelength and a frequency to matter wave. And uh, this wave needs an equation, and it's relatively simple to derive what, what equation it should be. I mean, afterwards, of course, it's always simple afterwards. Uh, if you take non-relativistic matter waves, so a dispersion relation which would be omega equal h bar k square over 2m, derived from the energy equal p square over 2m, and the simplest equation you can write to have for this dispersion relation is the Schrodinger equation, i h bar d psi over dt equal minus h bar square Laplacian psi. So after that, we have a kind of duality between light and matter. Uh, both are waves and particles. And I would like to start my talk by the following question. Besides this formal universality of wave physics, I mean, we will get spatial diffraction, spatial interference, both with light and matter. Are there phenomena that are specific to matter waves that are difficult to reproduce for light waves? And you can think of many of them, and I would be happy to discuss that uh, during the discussion session. But yeah, I just listed three of them. The first one is the sensitivity to gravity, which is obvious for matter waves and much less obvious for light waves. This was a talk by Philippe yesterday, so I will not comment more on that. The second one on which I would like to spend a few minutes is time diffraction and time interference. Uh, this exploits a nonlinear aspect, which is the nonlinearity of the dispersion relation, omega equal h bar k square over 2m, by contrast to the dispersion relation of light, which is linear, omega equal ck. And the other topic I would like to discuss, which will be the main core of my talk, is again about nonlinearity, but now it's the nonlinearity of the wave equation itself, the gross Pitalisky equation, where we, we take advantage of the interaction between atoms to, to, to get this nonlinear effect. And I would like to, to discuss in particular an effect which I think is new, which is a block oscillation, but not of a single atom or a single electron, but block oscillation of a macroscopic object, as we so let me start with a few words about time diffraction and time interference. So the experiment that I have in mind here is the following. You have a light wave, or matter wave, which arrives on a screen pierced with a single hole. And what you want to do is a temporal version of Young's slit experiment. So you have a shutter in front of the hole, and you are going to open and close twice the shutter. So you have two wave packets, which are produced after this double opening of the shutter, and you ask yourself, if you put a detector downstream, are you going to see an interference phenomenon linked to the two successive openings? If you take light with this dis linear dispersion relation, omega equals ck, then clearly the two wave packet will never overlap. So there is no time interference for light waves. However, if you take matter, omega equals h bar k square over 2m, you have a broadening of the wave packet, and indeed, an overlap is possible. So we studied that actually uh, a long time ago, now in Paris, 96. It was on an experimental setup that was, had been built with Andrew Steen, who is present in the audience. Andrew, I hope you remember that. It was a very pleasant time. And uh, there was, at the same time, a very important paper by Bruckner and Seilinger. But I would like to, to take the opportunity of this to, to, to 
pay a tribute to a member of the Pontifical Academy, which has not been mentioned up to now, which is Professor Moschinsky, who was working in Mexico City. And I remember very well Professor Moschinsky stopping by in Paris to discuss with us while he was coming to the meetings of, of the Pontifical Academy. So that was my first contact with Pontifical Academy was through uh, Professor Moschinsky, who was explaining me what was going on in the Academy and also discussing this time interference phenomena. And he had worked on that in the 50s and the 60s. OK, so let me go now to the main core of the talk, which is interacting current matter waves. So I assume that I'm dealing with a collection of bosonic particles, which are all prepared in the same state, really bosonshine condensate. These particles are described by this collective wave function, psi of R and T. And I describe the interactions between these particles by a nonlinear term proportional to density, so the modulus square of the wave function, with a coefficient g, which can be positive or negative. If g is negative, I will get attractive interaction. If g is positive, I will get repulsive interaction. And one nice feature of matter waves, as I contrast to light waves, is that I can mix different species. And as you will see, it will be important in the talk. So I can write coupled gross Pitayevsky equation for psi 1, psi 2, and so on. So I would like to, to discuss here not generality about, about this interacting matter wave, but focus on a one-dimensional physics, which is solitons. We have heard about two-dimensional physics uh, with vortices in uh, the superb talk of Martin. Let me talk, uh, stick to in 1D, so let's consider solitons. And at the beginning, I am start with a single component, Bosanchein uh, condensate. And so I take attractive interaction, G negative, in this Bosanchein uh, equation. And with G negative, we can form a soliton simply because we have a balance between two terms in the, in the gross Pitayevsky equation. We have first the kinetic energy term, which tends to expand the wave packet. And if I have attractive interaction, G negative, uh, this will contribute to maintain the atoms together. And therefore, there can be an equilibrium state. And the stationary solution is written on, on, on the board. It's just the one of a uh, hyperbolic cosine of kappa x, where kappa is, uh, depends on the parameters of the problem, mass of the atom, and uh, the value of G. And this was observed already more than 20 years ago now in the group of Randy Hewlett, who is here, and Christophe Salomon. And I would say there is no real mystery associated with these solitons. If I apply a force on each particle, a force F, then the, the evolution of the momentum of the soliton, dp over dt, will simply be proportional to the number of atoms, well, equal to the number of atoms times the force. And the momentum is nothing but the, the number of particles times the mass of a single particle times the velocity. So if you apply a force on such a soliton, it is uniformly accelerated. And you can see a similar behavior in many setups, including light waves. If you have some extrinsic uh, nonlinearity, if you put the light in a nonlinear medium. Now I would like to turn to a, a new platform, which was pioneered by uh, Sandro Stringari, who is also sitting in the audience, and uh, Ku and Pitaevsky in 2016 which are mixtures of uh, 1D quantum gases to produce what are called magnetic solitons. So here, I take a two-component uh, condensate, so majority component that I call one, minority component that I will call two. For simplicity, I take the same mass, M1 equal M2. And I will assume here that all the interactions are repulsive, you know, by contrast to the, to the first soliton. Now, all the interactions are repulsive. So G11, which interaction of atom 1 with atom 1 is repulsive. Same thing for G22, and same thing for G12. And I will further assume that I'm in the demixing regime, slightly demixing regime. What does it mean to be in the demixing regime? It means that the G12 coefficient, characterizing the interaction between atom in 1 and atom 2, is actually larger than the geometrical mean of G11 and G22, which I call G bar. And I said slightly the mixing regime uh, by, because I will assume that the difference between G12 and G bar is very small compared to G bar itself. So the two phases, one and two, tends to demix, but very gently. I'm close to the demixing point, to the critical point for demixion. So why is it interesting to be close to this uh, demixing point? Because then you have two types of excitation in the system, very different energies associated with two types of excitation. Uh, you have some low energy excitation, which we can call spin excitation, where the total density, rho 1 plus rho 2, will be constant. 
but simply the difference rho 1 minus rho 2 will fluctuate in this resistive excitation, which will be partial to delta G. And then we have another class of excitation, which are the high energy, uh, well, excuse me, the density excitation, which have a high energy cost, for which the total density will vary, rho 1 plus rho 2, and the energy associated with this, in, uh, with this excitation will be proportional to G bar. So here I will work in the low energy sector. Uh, this is what uh, Sringari and, and co-workers have called magnetic solitons in this context, for which the total density will always be constant. Right? And I will deal only with uh, the fluctuation of rho 1 minus rho 2. So just to make things clear, so what I'm considering is a uniform bath of particle 1 with an asymptotic density rho 0. And I have a minority component composed of N2 particle, which sits in the middle of this bath and which tends to create a little hole in the bath because of the demixing uh, regime I'm considering. So now let's suppose that this soliton moves. So this is a, a tricky slide. Let's suppose that this uh, soliton moves. And let's ask ourselves, what is the momentum of this soliton when it moves? So again, I have drawn here my, my, my component 2 in red in the middle of the bath, which is blue. And if the soliton moves, you can imagine that there is a phase difference in the bath between the left-hand side of the soliton, the point x minus, and the right-hand side of the soliton, the point x plus. There may be a phase drop uh, due to the motion of the soliton. We'll see later how it is, enters into the game. So let me call this phase drop delta phi, phi 1 of x minus, minus phi 1 of x plus. Now, if you ask me what is the momentum of the soliton, you can think of first the local momentum associated to this motion of the red blob inside the blue blob. But you immediately realize that the local momentum associated to this motion is zero because I have some positive momentum due to the fact that the red atoms are moving, but this positive contribution is compensated by the fact that I have a hole in the bath which is also moving at the same speed. So there is no net motion of matter when this soliton moves, so there is no local momentum. You could say, OK, this means that the momentum of the soliton is 0. But that would be wrong, because there is a second momentum entering in the game, which is the so-called backflow momentum. And a simple way to, to understand what is the backflow momentum is to take not a linear geometry, like on the left-hand side, but a ring geometry. So now the bath has one periodic boundary condition. And now, since the wave function of the bath has to be single-valued, it means that the phase of the bath, which I've called phi 1 here, has to be, the, to, be, to be uniquely defined up to a factor of 2 pi, possibly. And so if I call capital M the point which is opposite to the soliton on the, on the bottom of the ring here, let's say that I start in capital M with a phase which is 0. The phase from M to the point x minus has to gently increase. Then you have the phase drop at the location of the soliton between x minus and x plus. And then from x plus to m, it has again to gently increase. And we all know, again, this is De Broglie, which taught uh, this to us, that if you have a phase gradient, you have a velocity uh, in the bath, which is simply the derivative of the phase, special derivative of the phase, d phi 1 over dx times h bar over m. And therefore, you have a momentum associated to this motion. This is a called backflow momentum which is simply the integral of the, of the velocity along the, the path out of the soliton from x plus to m to x minus. Uh, and since the velocity is just a derivative, it's very easy to take the integral. And this backflow momentum is nothing but h bar rho 0 times delta phi. OK. And this will be the, the key element in, in the rest of, of what I want to do. So we have this phase drop, which induces this backflow momentum. And now let's suppose that I have a force acting on the soliton. So then I know that uh, the, the momentum dp over dt, the variation of the momentum will si be simply the proportional to the force. The force uh, here acts only on component 2, only on the red atom, not on the blue. So the, the dp over dt will be simply n2f, which means that the momentum has to increase linearly with time. But now, suppose that the momentum, I, I wait long enough so that the momentum increases by 2 pi h bar rho 0 which means that the time should be equal to 2 pi h bar rho 0 divided by n2f. That means that the phase drop, delta phi, has increased by 2 pi, because, again, I have this simple relation between p, momentum, and delta phi, the phase drop. But now if the phase changed by 2 pi, I know that the physics should not change, which means that the physical parameters of the soliton, I mean position, velocity, energy, 
must be periodic in delta phi. And therefore, at the time Tb, which is written above, the soliton should come back to its original position. So I have a situation where I have a macroscopic object, which is this N2 atom in the, in the bath. I apply a force on this atom, and this atom should undergo an oscillation. So this is very like block oscillation, where you have, okay, where you have an electron in a, in, a, in a solid, and you apply a force, and this electron oscillates in the periodic potential created by the solid. So we decided to make an experiment to check that. So I'm going to be very fast because I have only five minutes left. So we did an experiment either on a segment or on a ring. Uh, we print a soliton by making uh, our atoms in blue are in some uh, internal state of rubidium atom. So we transfer some atoms from a given internal state to another internal state uh, by printing the correct uh, form of the soliton. We check that in, when we do that, we produce a steady state object. And then we apply a force on the red atoms and we look at what happens. And indeed, we see a nice oscillation. So here you see the, the red component oscillating in the middle of the blue component. It oscillates at a frequency which is the fre expected frequency. So I have re rewritten here the frequency that we expect. The, blo the block frequency is simply N2F divided by H bar of zero, and the experiment uh, verifies this very nicely. So this is not the first time that the block oscillations are seen without a, 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 a lattice behind. Uh, there, it has been seen in a Hans Christian Tiger group a few years ago for an atomic impurity in a 1D Bose gas, strongly interacting 1D Bose gas. But here, I insist, we have a block oscillation at, for a macroscopic object. Here, we have something like 1,000 atoms which are undergoing this block oscillation. It's a macroscopic object which is undergoing this very quantum phenomenon, which is the block of station. Uh, last slide before concluding, uh, we also made this experiment in a ring to check for this backflow <coughs> momentum, check whether the backflow momentum was really present. So uh, we, we applied now, we produce our soliton on the side of a ring, this is the red dot that you see again on the left figure. We apply a force from the top to the bottom, and we indeed see again an oscillation of our soliton. And then, in order to check whether we have this backflow momentum, this phase which is built in the reservoir, we decided to make an interference experiment. That is, we put an inner ring which we use as a phase reference. And at a given time, we release the atoms both from the inner ring and the outer ring, and we look at the interference. So at time t equals zero, we see nice concentric fringes, which means that in the phase of the bus is uniform. And after one block period, we see a very nice parallel, which means that we have built a two pi phase in the bath, which is nothing but the backflow I had introduced before. So here in this context, the block oscillation in a ring are nothing but a vortex pump for the majority component. So this is the team who has done this in, 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 uh, in our lab, and mostly the, the PhD thesis of uh, Guillaume Chauveau and Franco Rabeck. And now I conclude. Um, so. I hope I convince you that matter waves are really a very nice platform for quantum physics. Uh, they can have metrological application and quantum, for quantum sensing. And here I've reminded you not only the gravimeter, but also the measurement of forces with usual block oscillation, where you have a single particle in a periodic lattice of period L, then you have a oscillation with a frequency FL over H bar, so you can measure F here. Today, I've shown you that we can have block oscillation not only with a microscopic object like an atom, but also with a macroscopic object, a large number of atoms, with a frequency for the block oscillation, which is very close, actually, to the standard block formula, uh, Fn2 over h bar or zero. And you have many other questions that are interesting with, with matter waves. Here, yeah, I just show a cartoon of a question that we, is still pending. It's an observation that we had a few years ago about the absence of thermalization in uh, the gross Pitelski equation for some specific shapes. So here I show a triangle which is oscillating forever in a, in a, in a, in a uh, harmonic potential. Actually, the triangle has been explained, but we have other shapes which are not explained, which are perfect breather. Uh, we have a disk, for example. Uh, and then, but this will be the subject of talks later in this workshop, these matter waves show turbulence. They show super solidity. So I think this is really a, a very, a very nice object to manipulate.